159th meeting of the ECCL. Never thought we'd get that far. Uh, are there people in the audience who would like to uh, introduce themselves? They haven't been here before and knew the community, whatever have you. Anybody? All right. That's fine. Glad to see all of you old timers. <laughs> that kind of stuff. Um, I'd start out with, uh, with uh, the chief. Uh, okay, good to have you here. I'm San Carlos, uh, just remind me your name. Uh, Alexis Crawford. Alexis, good to have you. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. We'll keep it nice and short for you. I've got four things. Uh, this Saturday is going to be Safe Kids Day at Gulf Coast Town Center. It's a program run out of Galisano Children's Hospital, so there's going to be just, like, a lot of family fun activities. We'll have a fire truck out there, but um, just a lot of really good safety information. So if you have kids or grandkids and want to bring them out, it's 11 to 2. Everything's free. There's food, fun, entertainment, some bands out there. I think we have an FGCU basketball team out there playing hoops with the kids and stuff. So that'll be fun. Uh, our annual report is now available on our website that has our statistics and everything from 2016, so you can visit sancarlosfire.org for that. Uh, we are getting close to the start of hurricane season. Actually, they just, uh, our first named storm this 2017, Tropical Storm Arlene. In case anybody missed that, that's weird, right? It's April. <laughs> uh, anyway, hurricane season starts June 1st, so in the spirit of preparedness, if we'd like to have a hurricane preparedness seminar, at one of the communities. Let's do that before the season starts. Okay, this year, get going soon, maybe next month. Uh, give us a call, we'll get that scheduled. Um, and then while I talk about rain, let's be mindful that uh, brush fire season is in full effect. We had a big one down Golden Gate last night. Uh, who knows, windy today, could have something to say. Be mindful of that. No cigarette butts out the window, no parking a hot car on dry grass. Um, embers from like little fire pits you have in your backyard, stuff like that. Any little thing is setting something on fire right now. So we can just be really, really, really mindful of, uh, of our hot stuff and keep brush fires at a minimum so we can get a little bit of that rain and worry about hurricanes. for you because I got home at 10 o'clock last night from Collier County and I need to go back to the fires. I'm glad she covered everything for me. <laughs> uh, I do have just one thing that we've changed on our smoke detector program that we've been doing for many years. We're doing those on Mondays and Fridays now. Uh, it became so taxing to do it all week so we're scheduling them on Mondays and Fridays in a certain time period. Still call us, let us know. Uh, just remember that if somebody doesn't show up exactly the time it's because our primary mission is emergency response. They may be on an emergency call. They'll get back with you and they'll, they'll follow up with that. So that's all I really have for right now. Questions? Chief, could you comment on the, the age of smoke detectors? I understand it's 10 years and the 10 year battery life detectors. Do we need them? Do you recommend? What do you recommend? Yeah, the new state statute that came out, I believe, in January uh, recommended the way is going to a we don't want to call them 10-year life batteries anymore because we want to call them long life because we don't know if they're actually going to last 10 years. So it is recommended that after January of uh, this year, I believe it was, or it might have been last year, that when you change it out, you do change to the 10-year or long life detectors and batteries. So if you've had detectors for you know more than 10 years, we're suggesting people go and get all the detectors, You know, make sure they're the right ones. We'll install them. We do not do any electrical work. You know, if they're electric and they're plug and play, we can do that. But if they're any type of wiring or anything, we're not certified electricians and we don't want to be liable for that. So, Thanks. anybody else have any other questions? Scott, what's the name of the group that does that, though? There's a group that does install them and do electrical work. There is a group of firefighters that started a business. Um, I think it's called Smoke Detector Medic. Um, if we can't get to you, or you do need some more in, in, in intensive work than what we do, they're more than happy to come out uh, and provide. It, it, is, it, it is a business they started, um, so you know, they can come out and do that. I know several of our residents uh, wanted some moved and stuff like that and, and, and hired those folks to do that, so you can do that. But we will still come out uh, and change the, the typical uh, battery and detector out at no cost uh, for you. Other questions? Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
next speaker is Jim Wilson, the counselor from uh, Grand Asa, uh, to give the village report. Thank you, Jim, for coming. Thank you, Don. Can everybody hear me all the way in the back? Good. A big change occurred this year on April 5th at the village council meeting. After serving as the first village mayor for two years, Nick Betos is now succeeded by Jim Bosch of District 5 for a two-year term as mayor. Uh, mayor Bosch was previously mayor up in Connecticut back in the 80s. According to the village charter, the, the mayor's role is purely ceremonial. This is different because the if we had a direct election, then the, the mayor, like in Benita Springs and in Fort Myers, would have additional powers. But basically, all the powers here in Estero are granted to the full council. The council also appoints a vice mayor. Bill Ribble was appointed to follow Howard Leviton as our second vice mayor. The council feels that rotating the position of mayor enhances teamwork and the professional behavior and builds character for the council's reputation. In fact, the Lee County Commission also rotates their chairmanship every year. Uh, I noticed in this morning's paper a piece of breaking news, and I know I have received a few emails from people that don't like the news, but I want to share it with you anyway. That news is that MCH plans to construct a 40,000 square foot medical center across from the COVID-19 mall. It's about a $30 million project and plans to be a two-story building with an emergency room so that we will have two different emergency rooms here in Estero, which Considering that we've had none and that many of us have had to use emergency rooms and had to drive our cars either down to Naples or north into Fort Myers, it could be good news. More importantly, people have been asking me, well, what is the village council and the village staff working on? Uh, very recently, in our most recent meeting, we secured more space so that the consultants uh, that we have working for the village will have a workspace to be in. We're, uh, we have the whole first floor over there in, in what we call Village Hall, and we previously had half of the second floor. Well, we now will have the whole second floor, but we are able to stay with still only seven full-time employees, which is part of, part of our commitment as a council to stay with the concept of government life. One of the things that we don't want to do is just take space and or hire people and then when the assignment or the need for their services fades, then, then if they're under contract, all we do is end the contract. And so far it's working very well. When we took over the roads, we, uh, we hired consultants to work with us to plan what we're gonna do on the maintenance things. And it would appear that we're gonna probably save over a million and a half dollars by taking that contract back from the county where we were spending two and a half million dollars and we will be spending less than a million. Uh, the village-wide traffic study nears completion and we will share it both with the county and the residents. This is the consulting firm that's measuring traffic points. They started and fortunately did it right during high season, so we will have worse, what I call worst case data available uh, to be using to figure out where we can make adjustments and changes in that. An area-wide stormwater data model for continues. We are working within our own boundaries and with a consultant to build a, a map that uses the 2013 high water stuff so that we will know where water's flowing to, whether it's coming to the village, whether it's going down into the Imperial River in Benita. That one's gonna take a little while to do. We probably won't see that result for another year. Something that was near to my heart, the Springs One apartment complex on Benville Griffin across the road the village was able to reach an agreement with them where they're going to do extensive additional landscaping on the first phase so that we won't be looking at a stark, ugly apartment building abutting Benton River. Uh, we, the village has begun to review options for acquiring pieces of vacant land. We're blessed financially. We have some surplus funds. There is quite a bit of uh, vacant land that is on the market. I can't tell you exactly what we're looking at because that would 
would help the brokers who are trying to jack the prices up. But I know the staff is very involved with that. The village is also moving several large projects through the planning and zoning process. The one that will come up next is the proposed apartment complex next to Lowe's offered by the Stark Development Company. That will actually be heard in a special council meeting on May 24th. A sterile parkway design planning continues. We hope to have the scope of that project designed by June, at least in place for public review by June or July. The village is continuing to lobby county officials to slow down and complete their studies before the final approval of the new developments and the new mines that are out to the east of us. Future role of ECCL. The village council believes that as elected officials, we represent all of the 30,000 permanent residents of the village and not just the gated communities. Residents look to us for solutions and issues and ideas. The village deeply appreciates ECCL's shared communication support and promises to strengthen village news-oriented reporting on the web and by email, especially in the face of weak newspaper coverage of our meetings and our actions. The village council will be using this medium to reach more people on a regular basis and perhaps council members scheduled appearances here at these meetings may be reduced as we each continue to accept more and more outside interfaces here in Estero and in Lee County. However, we pledge to do a more complete job in keeping everyone informed. Finally, the council encourages ECCL members to attend our meetings as we now have two chances, the first part of the meeting and the second part of the meeting to raise non-agenda items in each meeting. Thank you. Anybody have a question? You mentioned the traffic study report coming out. Do you have a date and time on that? There is a committed date from the consultant and I think it's in late June when they're supposed to first review it with staff and then like a week or two later it comes out. Yeah, I have Well, it will come, it will come, whatever they said at that meeting and voted on will be their recommendation. Staff may offer that recommendation, but yeah, I think, I think that's a good concept. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Thank you very much. Oh, I'm sorry, Beverly? Yes, you mentioned something, let me get it straight, that you don't think the council people will be coming to the ECCL meetings because they're going to be involved with the council people every month? That's correct. And why is that? I'm speaking only for myself. This is the fifth day this month that I've attended a meeting. So as we've got all these liaison shifts that we have to go to, it's just become a full-time, full-time job. But you'd have to ask each council member whether he or she wants to come to the meeting. Maybe once a year I'll be happy to be here, but I can't be here every month. It's just overwhelming. Well, basically there's like seven people and you come maybe once a month or twice a year at the most. And that's what we've done, rotate the invitation. Yeah, we don't, we only be coming twice a month. We agree, we'd like to have you here. Well, that's why we're going to improve our other communications. We don't necessarily do a wonderful job of putting out news about what we've done, but we will be working to improve that. Anybody else? At this point in time, the village is silent. At this point in time, the village's email system reaches 600 households. Ours is 4,000. And in addition to that, with Tom's help, we've done a lot of things with Facebook and other social media that Tom will talk about that probably, 
you know, given his skills and that of the people he uses, it would be hard to replicate. So we're committed, as I told Jim when we talked before the meeting, we're committed to working with the village to try to get public participation, effective public participation. It's been our role for the last two years, and it will continue to be our role as we look ahead. It's one of the goals that we play, and an important one. With that, our first guest speaker today relates to one of the announcements that Jim made, and that's another phase of our partnership, Lee Memorial. As most of you know, we've been working with Lee Memorial for 12 years, since they acquired the 30-acre parcel behind the Benita Community Health Center. And they've been a wonderful partner. They tried to get a hospital for us, went to Tallahassee, Scotty Wood and I went up there and testified along with a tremendous support group from Lee Memorial. NCH fought that, and as a consequence, was denied by the, that authority was denied by the state. And so then, we worked with Lee Memorial, and they went back to the drawing board and tried to do, they did an assessment of the health care needs of our area, both Benita and Estero. And the facility that they're planning on building now is underway, the site preparation is underway, a $170 million project is designed to satisfy all the different kinds of health care needs of our aging community for many, many years to come. And frankly, I view the NCH initiative as an effort to try to undercut the Lee Memorial initiative. That's a personal perspective. In any instance, we're honored today to have with us Ann Frazier, who's a major gift officer, not with the hospital, but with the Lee Health Foundation. They're the ones who raised the money for the Children's Hospital and all the other great facilities that Lee has. Now have six hospitals in Lee County, and ours will be eventually the seventh, but only if this project is very successful. And that's what we've been trying to do, is to demonstrate to the state, through the effective operation of the Lee Village Health Village, that, you know, that a hospital is justified at this location. And that's what scares me about this other proposal. In any instance, I'd like to introduce Ann Frazier to talk about a private, their efforts to get the community involved in helping to finance this new facility. Thank you, Ann, for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Don, for the introduction. Anybody need a hand up, they get a hand up. Would you mind? Thank you. Well, I will be brief. I know it's warm in here, and Don did such a great introduction for us, but we've been on a journey together, as you heard. It started about 12 years ago or so. And through that time, we've had a lot of meetings, state, political meetings, with local community leadership, and we did a lot of listening as well, patients, residents. And so we're working on this $140 million facility, 172,000 acres, breaking ground on May 18th, Lee Health Coconut Point. It is a healthy living campus. It's designed not just to be your freestanding emergency room and to have all your diagnostic testing, imaging, breast cancer services, but also a healing place, a place for rehab, a place where people can have bike paths, walking, farmer's markets, a lot of room on 31 acres. Compared to, I'll just mention it because it was brought up, NCH three and a half acres across the street. So $140 million facility that we've been on a journey together in the beginning with you all, and we hope that you'll continue on this journey with us. And we know, much as the Children's Hospital, 
Philanthropy is what makes this community great and what gives, provides so many of the wonderful services that we have. Of the $220 million that was raised for Valsana Children's Hospital, America's newest children's hospital, over $100 million came from the community support. And that's the community's touch, and that's the community saying that with gratitude they give back, and they're giving back to others who might have experienced things like them. And that's all I'm asking. All I'm asking of you all today is to go back to your communities, talk about the project, encourage people if they want to give back to their community and give back to other people's healthy lifestyles, to give me a call, let the foundation know. Um, they can write a check, they can offer to have us come to your community and do a presentation. Um, you can fundraise together and have a little special events to give back. Many of the communities have done that over the past, and those collective gifts make a difference for generations to come. So I just ask for y'all's support, and just ask that you give me a call, that's why I gave my card and everyone, um, to set up something that we can come and talk, whether it's, again, just as a community presentation, or talk to individuals, or if you know anyone that's interested in our project and wants to learn more, please let us know. Yeah. Just, just out of curiosity, are there any plans for, for Lee Health to incorporate the existing Benita Health building, or is that going to turn into an albatross when everything comes into a, uh, to a bloom? Um, that's something that I don't think I can, I'm not, I'm not a little above my pay scale to be able to comment on right now. So, 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 so um, I will tell you what, if you want to contact me, you can schedule something, I'll see if I can get some leadership around to make it. There's been a legal battle going on between those two parties for a long time. Yes. Actually went to arbitration, the arbitrator, Welch, he was supposed to decide who would get the facility and pay off the other guy. Mm -hmm. Didn't do it. So it's, it's been a kind of a stalemate, and uh, uh, it's just unfortunate. But that's, that's there. Uh, I think both uh, parties are committed to keeping that in operation, and everybody believes it will operate effectively, and maybe even properly. It's been losing about yes, 10 I million know a year for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. Thanks, uh, Bill? Uh, I want to stand up to speak from here. Uh, ah, thank you. My name is Bill Douglas. I live in Brooks, and I'm one of the people that went down to testify why you should have a hospital here in Stero. And I am insulted. I'm going to be very straight about it. And Councillor, you, uh, you can hear me. I am insulted by the fact that North Collier Hospital is here pointing their finger in our eye again. And I don't like it at all. I'm one of the residents who wants, I want to offer a resolution. I want this council to pass a resolution of support for what you want. Uh, and I really do. I want to thank you for all of the work. You were in our corner when we went through the corporation, when we went through all of our struggles, and the people in North Collier stuck their finger in our eye. They don't care about better health care. They want more money. And I'll be quoted on that. They want more money. So I hope uh, and I would offer a resolution of support that this ECCL will support your efforts to raise money for the hospital. It's a good way of thanking you and Jim Nathan and all the people in Lee Memorial for the amount of money and effort that you put in in supporting our community. You've supported our community. We have a right to support you. Thank you. Resolution. Jack, uh, Jack Lenish uh, seconds the motion. Any discussion? Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Thank you very much. So we'll we'll you, help yeah. in every Thank way you. we can uh, to get that $20 million. Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, so moving, on, moving along, uh, if we can. The, uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Thomas Falke, 
Uh, we worked with Tom a few years ago through the ECIF, where Tom and his group, uh, he's a professor at FGCU, among other things, uh, where he did a needs assessment of the community uh, for the uh, Sterile Community Improvement Foundation. And that was uh, conveyed to the, to the village and has been used by the village for a variety of different purposes. So Tom's working on another project now and would like to tell everybody about it. So with that, thank you, Tom. Thanks, Tom. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for giving me a few minutes of your time. As Don mentioned, I'm Dr. Tom Felke. I'm the chair of the Department of Social Work at Florida Gulf Coast University. And I'm here to talk to you uh, very briefly today about another study uh, that we are undertaking, which is an update to a study we did back in 2012. Uh, in 2012, I was contracted by Collier Senior Resources to conduct a study of uh, needs of seniors in Collier County. Uh, we did that study solely in the Naples area at the time, and that study, its results led to a report that was utilized to obtain three quarters of a million dollars in private funding to establish the first ever senior center in Collier County. A secondary senior center was then also established in Golden Gate. The original idea for that senior center in North Naples was that it would accommodate about 200 to 250 seniors. That center now has a membership of over 800 seniors. And we've utilized our report from 2012 to gain another half million dollars of private funding to support the expansion of that center. It's been five years, it's time for an update. And in looking at the demographics of the participants for the senior center in Naples, uh, in North Naples and in Golden Gate, what we found is that those centers are drawing. They're drawing participants from Benita Springs, from Marco Island, and from Estero. So as a result, I've uh, requested that we expand the scope of the study this time around to include focus groups to be held in each of those areas. So we're going to be holding focus groups here in Estero over at the Recreation Center. We'll be holding four sessions that we have scheduled right now. What we're looking for are individuals age 60 and over who are full-time, part-time, or seasonal residents of Estero to come in and talk with us. It will be about an hour and a half of your time. You will complete a brief demographic survey and then uh, participate in a one hour facilitated conversation, largely to talk about what are the things that you feel are needed, what are the things that are currently available to you that are working well, and what are some of the opportunities and challenges that you see in the area around the needs of seniors. So those four sessions are currently scheduled. We're doing them two in a day. So the first set will be on uh, Monday, May 8th. We'll start at 10 o'clock in the morning and run until 12. We have a second one scheduled in that afternoon from 4 o'clock to 6 o'clock. We'll then do the same thing on Wednesday, May 10th. We'll go from 10 o'clock to 12 o'clock again and then a second session from 4 o'clock to 6 o'clock. If anyone has any questions, I have a few flyers that I will leave up front on the table so people can get that information. What we're asking is that you RSVP either by calling or emailing and letting us know which of the sessions you would like to attend. We will accommodate anywhere from 25 to 30 people per, uh, per session. We've already interviewed or had participants uh, about 70 participants in this study, and we'd like to get well over uh, 150, if possible, between the areas that we're looking at currently. Any questions? Um, since you're having these in May, a lot of the seasonal people are gone or already will be gone by then. Are you going to be doing something in the fall as people start to come back? We'll, we'll look to do that. We, to be honest, the seasonal residents do not seem to be the residents who are attending the senior center. It is primarily the full-time <coughs> residents or what we're calling part-time residents, so not necessarily seasonal per se. Um, so that is actually our main focus, particularly here in Estero based on the demographic analysis we've done so far. It's not that we don't want to hear from seasonal residents, 
but we tried to actually get some focus groups started earlier in Estera, and we just didn't have a great response, so now we're taking another approach to try and get the word out about the focus groups. Yes? Go ahead, Jack. Where are these uh, focus group meetings going to be? They're going to be at the Estero Community Rec Center. Okay. And as all four sessions will be held there. We were going to do them at the library, but due to a change in how they do their scheduling, it was a little bit easier to use the recreation center. Can you repeat the dates again? <clears throat> I'm sorry. The dates again? The dates are May 8th and May 10th. And the times on both days are 10 a.m. to noon and 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. Contact phone number? Contact phone number 941-313-7270. Or you can reach me at my email, which is T as in Thomas, F-E-L-K-E -E, at fgcu.edu. And again, I'll have some flyers that have all that information on it as well. Uh, Don, could you put that up on our website so we can get it? Be happy to edit. If, uh, if it makes sense, we can send out a, uh, an email yeah. to the 4,000 people on our list. And if need be, we will schedule more focus groups because we really want to do get as much participation in this process as possible. Okay. Who's paying for the study? The study is being paid for by Jewish Family and Community Services of Southwest Florida. They are the ones that have the Southwest Florida, and this study is for what area again? This study is going to cover uh, Marco, all of Collier County, Bonita Springs, and Estero, as that is the draw group that's currently attending that center. Thank you. You're welcome. I've been to the, uh, the senior center down there, it's just south of Pine Ridge. <clears throat> it's actually uh, not bought to the east of uh, US 41, just right on Costello Yeah, down there. And it's uh, my wife Susie's been down there, you know, for uh, different events and stuff like that. Uh, it's conceivable, I suppose, that they might end up building another senior center for their north to uh, get enough response. That, and to be perfectly honest, that is one of the targets for this, is to look at possible expansion. It's a great asset to the community, no question. Thank you, Tom. Thank you all very much. Yeah. Right along, our next speaker is uh, Bob King, our transportation director. And uh, Bob recently uh, was selected by the uh, Estero Village Council uh, to be on the Planning and Zoning Board. Fill a vacancy there because there are so many traffic implications associated with each of the uh, major developments that are going through the review process. So, with that, Bob. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> what I'd like to do is to spend a little time today going through a little bit of update of what happened over the last month concerning some of the more critical activities in the transportation area that have occurred. Um, I wanted to update a little bit what's happening with the I-75 interval improvements. Um, as I had mentioned previously, uh, the long-term uh, improvement to be made to the interchange will occur when they add additional lanes. So they will completely reconstruct the interchange. That isn't likely to occur you know, for quite a while. But what they are going to do is add some additional turning lanes uh, to get the road to operate at an acceptable level of service probably through about year 2029. Those will, in, will include a, a left turn going north and a left turn going south off of Porkster Road. Uh, the preliminary design activity for that improvement is going on right now. The final design has not yet started. Uh, I have reported previously that I, I was told that the funding uh, for this project, because it was a relatively small effort, small to them is four or four and a half million dollars. Uh, that money could probably be appropriated from a maintenance budget. Uh, I have since learned from uh, Steve Whale, well, who was the new director. Uh, I met him at the CAC meeting last month and, and talked to him about the funding and he said, no, 
You never mix maintenance and construction funds. So they need to find the money, but he was confident that that could be done without a lot of difficulty. He's also indicated that he felt that the construction phase would begin in the fall of 18. So that's when they would actually begin to add this additional lane work. Uh, for those of you who try to get through that intersection uh, during different times of the today, we're currently operating at a level of service event. Uh, it, it, it can be tough. And with more development taking place to the east of this, uh, it isn't likely to get better before they start their improvements. Uh, Lee County has, of course, uh, I think of course you wrote, has an environmental overlay study going on right now. Uh, what this is intended to do is to gather information about uh, the transportation along Corkscrew Road as it pertains to these new developments. I've listed four of them that are involved in the study. What will come out will be the impact of those developments, the road improvements that are going to be necessary because of those activities, and then finally, a proportionate share estimation of what these communities should uh, donate in order uh, to accommodate the improvements that their projects are driving. One of the things that has occurred is the, the, the traffic study wasn't due to be completed until about December. And it was obvious that a number of these, particularly two of them, are currently uh, under investigation by either a planning organization or will be shortly going to uh, the desire of review board. Uh, it's, it wasn't timely to get information on traffic in December for decisions that were going to be made earlier. Uh, the council, uh, the, actually the county fathers have decided to compress the schedule They've gone back to the uh, development group, asked them to take a look at uh, the project with AIM. <coughs> AIM has worked to compress getting this information that's needed for the evaluation of these projects done sooner. You can see here some of the projected dates depending upon there were about nine elements to the study. Uh, you can see that they've now moved the dates up to where uh, the environmental support, the transportation uh, improvement costs are now going to be available about in the June time frame, which is much more timely uh, in line with the decisions that are going to be made on the projects as they go through the hearing examiner process and the, uh, the county commissioner's process. So I, I think it, it's, it really is a credit to the county for recognizing the need, going back and pushing on AIM to reduce the amount of time, and they agreed to do that. And the interesting thing is they agreed to do it without any additional cost. So they didn't do it as a change of work. Well, they did, but not with additional cost. Uh, the building transportation study, as Jim had mentioned, is currently underway. Um, the public uh, report on where they stand has not been scheduled yet. Uh, as soon as it is, I'll keep everybody informed. The, uh, the comprehensive plan. The Transportation Committee has spent a good deal of time in the last month or so focusing on the transportation uh, issues contained within the comprehensive plan. Uh, we've got a unique opportunity. The comprehensive plan is, is currently under uh, construction for the village of Estero. It must be completed by the end of this year. Uh, we have a unique opportunity to be able to have public input and affect those things that are going to affect each of us over the next 20 to 30 years. So we've got a unique opportunity and we're taking advantage of it. We have a committee put together that has already read into testimony uh, transportation issues. We will follow along as the other aspects of the uh, comp plan like uh, I guess the next one up will be the uh, Parks and Recs area. Uh, we will again participate there, uh, keeping an eye on what transportation aspects should be associated with providing those amenities to the community. 
Bicycle pedestrian master plan. The NPO has uh, approved a hundred thousand dollar plan. Uh, that money should be available uh, in 19. Right now, FDOT and the NPO are both attempting uh, to locate that funding sooner. Uh, their Cape Farrell already has their plan. Uh, we have a rough draft of ours <clears throat> that needs to now be approved and funded. And we will get a, a, a master bike and pedestrian plan uh, for our community. That concludes the uh, comments I had. If I have any questions, I can. Yes. Uh, yes. That, no, that is a, uh, really what I have heard was that the uh, the recommendation by a planning and zoning board that would, uh, would go to the village council is that no vertical construction on that project be done until the frontage road and the traffic light that are associated with it are in place. Uh, one of the concerns that I think all of us have in, in transportation is the, the timing between the frontage road and the light and the improvements to the interchange. That those those occur in such a way as to not uh, create a problem, but to help solve them. But from uh, your comment is the frontage road and the traffic light, they require those to be in before they start building the apartment. But you've heard nothing about them pulling off their construction plan at all? Not, not until uh, this, not, no, not relative to the improvements uh, in the interstate. Yes, sir. Bob, is there any update on the discussions among the various government bodies on the railroad right away? You know, that's all going to be part of, of the, the comp plan input is to try and establish a long range goal for the utilization of that right of way uh, for a non motorized vehicle, uh, for perhaps commuter rail. There, there have been several uh, uses for that identified. That will be in the comp plan, I'm sure, because that's a resource that uh, would be a great help to the village. If you want to put a bike path in there, you've now just gotten them to the point where they can ride without being worried about getting hit by a car. So, no, it's got a lot of advantages and it will be addressed, I'm sure. <coughs> yes? Uh, the activation of the light. <laughs> oh, the light down in the south. No, I don't have a schedule on that. Uh, they, although I do know it's approved. Right. Joyce, do you have a? No, I'm going to call them to find out what their plan is. Because okay. they obviously need when I checked it yesterday. It's so busy here already before there's even a clinic here. There's got to be one. So we'll see what they're after. Okay. Any others? Thank you. Oh, yes, ma'am. I was Yes. That, that would be part of that would be part of what the, the goal would be <laughs> to be able to provide um, some multi-use path that could be used for walking or biking, mo a non-motorized uh, path. I really don't know the number of miles because it, it'll be a, co a, a cooperative effort between the village, Bonita Springs, probably Collier County, uh, and all up into Fort Myers. That's a that's quite a lengthy right of way. Let me let me just inter interject and say that the state of FDOT, the Florida Department of Transportation, has commissioned a statewide trail development uh, and the segment of, of the Railroad right away in Benita and Estero is part of that. Okay, it is not the rest of Lee County <coughs> does not use the railroad track for that uh, that that purpose. And there was a, recently a meeting between the uh, the village of Estero and the city of Benita Springs, a joint hearing on this matter. 
and both of them affirm their commitment to that uh, that project. We just were linear path when you park so well. I thought that was linear park, which does go along that railroad track. Yarborough Park, which is right there. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.
of uh, corkscrew road by their mine trucks. So that little appendage that, that comes down to corkscrew road is supposedly not going to be a driveway for their trucks. <laughs> However, we did point out at a uh, transmittal hearing that was on uh, April 5th, several of us from our environmental committee, a number of uh, nearby residents out in that area spoke before the BOCC um, about, uh, well, basically our opposition to this plan. The uh, Conservancy of Southwest Florida also spoke in opposition and so did Audubon. They did tell us that no trucks would be exiting from Cork or through that little uh, area to Corpsby Road. But it was pointed out to them that when trucks leave the property, those trucks, the drivers from all of these mines, are not mine employees. The mines cannot say which way you, you can go. They said that all the trucks will access 75 if they need to get to 75 by going north on Immokalee or northwest and to, uh, to access Interstate 75 by Daniels Parkway, which is not really shown very well on there, but it goes above that Troyer sign and accesses uh, Interstate 75. However, if a truck has a southbound load, like to Naples or uh, even to Benita, if they went from their property and did two right-hand turns, a right onto 82 and then a right onto Corkscrew Road, Corkscrew Road ends at 82 on the right side of that drawing. If you recall, it's a big T intersection out there. So if they did two safe right-hand turns, they could access Interstate 75 via Corkscrew Road over here. That is four miles longer than the other route, but right now there's fewer traffic lights there. So it may actually uh, benefit them by taking the extra mileage and saving time by not having to wait at traffic lights. Uh, that project did win approval by the Board of County Commissioners to be transmitted to the state. That means that the project, the proposed project goes to Tallahassee for certain state agencies to review. They typically give a rubber stamp, that's what they've been doing lately. It comes back to the Board of County Commissioners for zoning changes. Right now the zoning, the property is zoned agricultural. They have to change the zoning to industrial for this mine to go. The uh, uh, zoning examiner hearing, that's the hearing in which a zoning officer listens to testimony by the applicant, in this case Troyer Brothers and their many consultants, as to why the zoning should be changed from agricultural to industrial. The public, which includes us, we have an opportunity to voice our opinions about any changes to the zoning on that. The zoning hearing officer then makes a recommendation to the Board of County Commissioners as to whether the, uh, in this case, uh, the zoning change would be made in Map 14 of Lee County's comprehensive plan. Map 14 shows <laughs> in their plan what parts of Lee County are authorized for mining. Right now, most of those uh, parcels that are authorized are in the Alico Road area. So if you look at Alico Road, the road that's uh, north of number one there, you know there's a, where Alico Road meets Corkscrew Road, there's a big uh, Youngquist mine there. There are several other mines peppered up in that area. So having Troyer become a mining operation much farther east in the DRG area would be basically a big move by the county. We hope to get them to not do that, to keep the mining closer to Alico <coughs> Road and not farther out in the uh, DRG or further east than the DRG. What are they mining? I'm sorry. It's, it's become so so uh, well known to, to me. They are mining lime rock. It's the rock that that uh, underlies all of our land here. That rock is then used. It's crushed and it's used for building material to build the many buildings that we have here. Basically, it's the raw material for cinder block, for concrete, sand. So it is an essential building product. The mines here in Lee County supply a lot of the building construction material for most of Southwest Florida. 
they seem to be concentrated here. There's a very good um, resource here. Trucks can go as far north as Sarasota and uh, to uh, uh, Collier County. So it's a valuable resource. So that's what we're trying to uh, to get the county to think smart. So when they finish mining, do they pick the land up? No, typically what they do here when the mines play out, and you can actually see that, when the mines play out, they're basically digging a very uh, deep hole. In this case, uh, my memory serves me right, 70 to 90 feet deep. That rock is taken out. When you dig those big holes in South Florida, you get big lakes. And if you look at the drawing there, you see number one there in the very center of the uh, drawing says number one, that's wild blue. And you can see the, the blue kind of amoeba shape thing. That's a very big lake. That was a mine. It's all done, more or less, and now it's a big lake, wild blue, is going to build homes around those lakes. That's what they typically do. Corkscrew Shores, which is a little bit harder to see, but if you see the sign where it says Valaterra, the dark blue amoeba like that, just on the south side of, uh, of uh, Corkscrew Road, that's another big lake, and the developer is developing that into uh, 660 homes called Perks Crew Shores, homes around the perimeter of that lake. So that's what typically happens down here. Uh, there's another one down there in Benita Grandy, that's a uh, Benita Springs issue. So, but that mine, Troyer Brothers, is estimated with a 30 year operational life. If it's permitted all the way, it, they expect to start that in 2020. And then it can go for 30 years after that. They have said in the meeting 1,900 trucks per day, which sounds extremely high if you do all your math. That's like one truck a minute, 24/7. The math just doesn't sound right. But it, whatever it is, <coughs> it's a great number of trucks on either 82 or Corkscrew Road. Now 82 right now is two lanes in that area, but. Um, I understand it's supposed to be widened to four lanes in the future, so it may be able to accommodate a lot more trucks back then. But you know, I, I don't want to go too much beyond. I'm trying to keep this uh, short here too. But the next thing that we have to keep an eye on is the zoning examiner hearing, which is right now is unscheduled, as far as I know, and we will let people know about that so that if you want to express your opinions about more mining out in the DRGR, that's the time to do it. Now, in Lee County, you have a uh, funny condition here. You, the first thing, as I said, is the zoning examiner hearing. It's, right now, it's unscheduled. But after that, when the zoning officer makes, uh, in this case, it's a woman, when she makes her recommendation to the BOCC, if you want to express your opinion about the necessity of that mine, you must have spoken in advance <coughs> before the zoning officer first. So it's kind of a contingent. You must speak in the zoning examiner hearing in order for you to be heard by the commissioners at a later date. It's sort of a system that kind of works against the public, basically. And the thing about it is that the, the uh, applicant has an unlimited amount of time to make his or her case before the zoning officer. <coughs> when we speak, we have three to five minutes. So it's not really very uh, advantageous for the public here, but what we can say is if we get enough people to speak and they hear our, our, our uh, our desires loud enough, they may not go forward with it. Uh, I will say that at the transmittal hearing, that passed by a four to one vote. Commissioner Mann voted against transmitting this project to the state. The other four commissioners voted yes. We're going to move on to the other project called Pepperland Ranch. That's number uh, three on that uh, drawing right in the very center of that. There's a, a label there to Pepperland. Pepperland Ranch is uh, 700 acres on the south side of Corkscrew Road, uh, proposed 700 homes. 
the developer there wants to change the zoning from low density, one house per 10 acres, to one house per acre, so a tenfold increase, in return for providing environmental restoration on the, a, a decent size uh, part, approximately half of the property. Um, restoring sloughs, restoring um, some of the wetlands, and so on. The same thing happened with Perks Group Farms, which is number two, the rectangular parcel across the street from Perks Group, uh, from Pepperland Ranch there. It's now called the place of Perks Group. That is 1,325 homes. It has received all of its approvals and is currently under construction now. Beverly Ranch did go through the zoning transmittal uh, hearing uh, back on uh, May 4th, or excuse me, uh, it was in February. Mm -hmm. And now they have received their approval from the state. And a zoning examiner hearing is scheduled for May 4th at 9 a.m. That's next, uh, the week after next. So there, the uh, change is to change the zoning from low density to high density of agricultural to uh, high density of uh, residential. And so uh, if you have any opinions or want to express opinions about that, there is a time to go. If you want to speak before the, the Board of County Commissioners at a later date, that meeting is not scheduled, you must speak here first. What's the number of homes in Pepperland Ranch? When they, change, when they change the density, what will it be? 700. 700. Yeah. Are these homes only not condos in multiple As far as I know, they're, they're uh, single family residents. As far as I know. So where is the water coming from? Uh, drinking water, potable water. Um, Lines are being built from the more populated area, which is uh, on the uh, immediately on the east side of Interstate 75, along Corkscrew Road, out to that area. So potable water and sewage lines are being constructed. Uh, they've already been constructed for Corkscrew Farms, mm -hmm. and there is a very strong likelihood that the Pepperland Ranch. Um, uh, development will use those lines. Now there's another one out there called uh, number four. Uh, it's called Verdana. That's uh, roughly, if my memory serves me right, that's 1,400 homes. <coughs> that project is not as far along in the zoning process yet. Uh, they are still working with the, uh, the Lee County's community development or zoning staff on making tweaks to that proposed development. Mm -hmm. And when it gets to the point where the staff is happy with that, they will then go to the county commissioners for a, for a, a meeting there for, uh, uh, they'll go before the local planning agency first, which will decide whether to give it a thumbs up or a thumbs down recommendation to the board of county commissioners. And then at that meeting, they will decide to either transmit or not transmit that to the state. It's that same process again. But it, Verdana is farther behind the other two projects. Okay, I was told for North Lawn 75 and The question was the further uh, east you go on Corkscrew Road, your property taxes go down? Yeah. I wouldn't think so. I, I, I'm not a tax expert. I wouldn't think so. Is that the truth? Now, remember, this is not Mistero out that way. This is unincorporated Lee County. Okay. Mistero stops at Bella Terra, which is the uh, it, It's just pointed by the arrow in there. Okay. Yes, sir. Out of curiosity, where is all this wastewater from these probably an aggregate of 4,000 homes or so? Where was that all going? Without a wastewater the, treatment? The county has here. The, the question is, where does the wastewater from these new homes go? The county has said that it has facilities to accept the sewage from uh, the place of Corkscrew and Verdana at uh, Three Oaks uh, Wastewater Treatment Plant. You know where that is? Up Three Oaks, uh, yes. and that's what all the way to yeah. Before I move on, any other questions? So I really 
uh, encourage you, if you have things you want to say, you can write, you can show up, you can call the county commissioners about these projects. We will try to keep people informed. Come to our environmental committee meetings. We talk about these each time we meet about what we can say, what we can do. We uh, uh, develop talking points and we just educate ourselves about it. So this is a way that you can get involved in um, voicing your opinion about what happens to the east of Astero. Remember, what happens out there affects Astero. All right. Uh, touching on the, the village's comprehensive plan development, I think uh, Jim Catullus is going to talk a little bit more about it, and Bob uh, touched on it a little bit earlier. The village's uh, comprehensive plan development is ongoing now, and on uh, April 26th, 26th, sorry, I'm getting one a lot of dates in April, 1.30. On April 26th at 1.30, there's a slide here for you, you've got all these guys sitting in the stand. <laughs> The, uh, the zoning and planning board will be taking comment on part of the proposed uh, comprehensive plan. That's for parks and recreation. So our group, the environmental committee, is putting together our slate of comments that we think should be in the comprehensive plan regarding parks and recreation. And we'll be making those to the, uh, uh, the, the planning and zoning board on April 26th. Okay, at 1.30. May I add something also? The Estero Preservation, the, the Estero Historic Preservation Citizens Committee is having a meeting this coming Tuesday, prior to that day, uh, to meet with and talk about our points that we want. So you're welcome, it's at two o'clock at the cottage at the Estero Park. That's the Preservation Committee. Right. On the if you're interested in that aspect, please see. Uh, please see Marilyn. Uh, right after this meeting. Sorry. Uh, if you're interested in our meeting, what we are doing now, we are compiling our comments. I will compile them into one document and present that before the planning and zoning board on the 26th. A heads up. The next workshop is in May. May. 16th, it's 16th, it's on your, your, your thing. It's on environmental conservation and coastal concerns in the comprehensive plan. At our next environmental committee meeting, we'll be talking about what types of comments we want to provide to the uh, planning and zoning board at that May 16th meeting. So if you're interested in that, our next uh, meeting is uh, May uh, 7th or 9th, I forget, it's on slide here but you're welcome to come to that or you're simply welcome to provide your own comments on those in mid-May, May 16th. Jim Tifolos has a slide that has all of that information for that, uh, those dates. Um, May 9th. May 9th, is, May 9th is our environmental committee meeting at 1 or 2 o'clock, I forget the high mark bank, but you're welcome to come there. Listen to how we formulate these comments and opinions. This will all be in the ECCR report that comes out after this uh, project, at, and that's at 1 o'clock. Okay. So, our next meeting for our environmental committee is Tuesday, May 1st. Oh, excuse me. Uh, it's wrong. May 9th. May 9th. May 9th. I'm sorry, I made a mistake. It's May 9th. May 9th. Okay. And the mine mark bank. Oops. Yep. I'd like to make one comment. Uh, I'm head of the Coalition for Parks, Rec, and Education. On the parks and recreation portion, we have added education. The reason that is a thing called co location. When you build a school, you build additional open spaces, fields, and things like that. So that would be, I would be giving a presentation at that meeting from the coalition of about 55 people from the state. So watch our email alerts over the next couple weeks about these key dates and times and meeting locations if you're interested to provide your comments about how you want Estero to be and to look in the next 30 some years. <clears throat> Any other questions? That's all that I've got. Thank you. I'd just like to add a few in 
indignant comments about what people said. DRGR is a project we, the ECCL, have been involved in since about 2003, 2004. And back in those days, the effort was to try to mine everything out there, because there is some lime rock out there, and that type of thing. And all the land, there was a lawsuit over on the East Coast that almost shut down the lime rock mines over there. And as a consequence, all those big mining companies came over here and started offering big bucks to the landowners out here to the east. Well, that DRGR has that name for the purpose. That's the zoning for that whole area out there. DRGR. It's not commercial. It's not residential. It's DRGR, Density Reduction Groundwater Resource. And it has that name for a very good reason. That area out there is all swamped with 80 to 90% wetlands. That which is left of it at this stage of the game. As you look at a map out there, a lot of it already is in public ownership. But the remaining portion could end up with another 20 or 30,000 homes out there. And this administration has been moving in that direction, unlike the prior administrations. I served on the DRGR Advisory Committee for about two years. The county spent $1.6 million to replan that whole area out there and to lay plans that would make sure that the water supply that we will need as our population doubles would be available. 70 to 80% of all the potable water that is consumed in Lee County comes from about 250 wells out there in the DRGR. Our population today is 700,000. It's going to $1.6 million in the future. According to the University of Florida Bureau of Business and Economic Research, we'll be at $1.4 million in 2040, 25 years from now. We're adding about 15,000 people per year, about 2,000 kids to our schools every year, all that type of thing. So population control was a very, very important part. We're talking about almost 20% of the county out there, 80-some-thousand acres. And the whole notion was one per 10 acre and one per 20 acre. One per 10 was for uplands, one per 20 was the wetlands. And so the whole idea was you already have Lehigh and you have Cape Coral with all those little lots, that type of thing. You already designated all kinds of, given zoning authority to all kinds of opportunities. That's where the build-out population of $1.7 million comes from. You don't need any more zoning in order to get there. It's already been provided to the existing landowners. And then to have all your water supply out there be eliminated or reduced by eliminating wetlands and not connecting these properties, that's what it's all about. And so the strategy that we have to employ is to fight all of these different types of projects out there and to make as much noise about it and try to get as much PR as possible so people are aware of these issues. That's what it's all about. So I encourage you to participate in the process. Sometimes it seems very futile because you're going to end up losing most of them. That doesn't mean it's not important because we had a candidate for county board this last time came within a thousand votes of knocking off one of these guys that's been so supportive of all of these different projects. A thousand votes, less than one percent. Okay. So, and the other two guys that are constantly supporting these things are up in 2018. So, any instance, I don't mean to rattle on, but it's something I really feel strongly about.
in terms of the quality of life in the sterile in the future, if this thing isn't, if we don't deal with this, it isn't going to be what it is today. Bottom line. That's the bottom line. Uh, with that, I'd like to call on Jim Petulis to uh, talk, talk about what's going on with the uh, community uh, comprehensive plan and the other thing with the uh, community planning stuff. Thank you, Doug. Uh, you can't really read that very good, but the comprehensive plan, if the stated again would not be repetition too much, is when, when Estero became a village, they had three years to come up with a comprehensive plan of what they wanted the village to be as, as a goal. And so now we are, we're, our time's already up. We got two years past and we're into the last year. So we have to create, create this plan and have it presented to Tallahassee by the end of the year. And then Tallahassee will look at it, tweak it, and send it back, and that'll be the plan. And that's a master plan of the goal of where the sterile is looking to the future. Uh, what we've done is we've taken the, all parts of, of the plan into consideration and we made it month by month so that each month there's a different area of consideration and people who have you know, uh, specific uh, questions or things that they'd like to input on that at that month that this can be prepared. The next one is, as Pete said, it's going to be April 26th, 130. Now, just because this is so concrete, so so time consuming, it's that our, our meetings normally would start at 5.30 in the evening. But because this is so involved, we're starting at 1.30 in the afternoon and expecting it to run all the way to dinner. So uh, that's, it. that's how important it is. Now, you've got to understand that a comprehensive plan is simply goals and objectives. It's a, it's a goal that you'd like to see the city get and an objective to be able to get how to get to that goal. So it's not a law not anything like zoning. The zoning comes underneath the comprehensive plan. <clears throat> and that's when you get into specifics about particular pieces of property. We're talking about what we'd like to see the overall picture. And that includes like for 20 to 30 years out. So one of the things as a question for open land use, how big do you want to see a stereo eventually become? Do you want it to try to incorporate University and have it become part of it. You want to go all the way to Lethal Road and have a shopping center become part of it. These are things that are being discussed and things that will be considered. One of the things that I do know is that with all the expansion going out to the east along Cork Street, we don't have any control over it. And yet it doesn't affect us because the people are going to come from the east, they're going to come west. They're going to, when everybody wants to go to 75 to travel, they're going to go right through a stero. So that would be a goal, I, I would envision, of having a stero expand out there so we do have control by the village instead of by the, the county as to what's taking place out there. So this is, remember, a big picture, a wish list. So, so far, we're talking about parks and recreation and open space. So here's where the, the uh, consultant has amalgamated all the input that he's had to this point. And these are some of the points. To expand and improve access to Corshot and to the adjacent Hoover property across the street when we get to it. So that's, that's a goal. To encourage state and county land purchases in and around Estero. And that includes Edison Farms so that we have more, more preserved property. To protect the Estero River, the Estero Bay, and the creeks and public access for natural resources. Here's your environmental aspects. Recreational as as uh, aspects. If you want to put your boat in the water, you can go over to the bay shop or you can come over here. But there's no other public access to the river right now. So if we're talking about having the river, which is what Estero is called for, how do we get there? So there, there's a goal looking to purchase land, acquire developments, and, put, and get bicycle paths and pedestrian paths along the river. So those are goals. This is what we'd like to see happen. 
And then we want to establish green belts and blue ways. Uh, so linking to our shot with a Apahatchee, it has historic sites. And here's where Bev comes in with the historic aspects of it. And then we've got a problem. We're talking about a bike path along the railroad track. We're talking about all of these other areas around here, the river, Horshot, the Boomer. How do you get from there to here without crossing 41? <laughs> so one of the goals is going to be to find a way to get across. Will it be a, a bridge over? Will it be an underpass? We don't know. But one of the goals is to have a way for it to happen because otherwise we just split the town in half. Um, what we're looking at, of course, again as goals, to acquire the Estero Recreation Center, which Lee County presently owns. We don't own that, but yet it's in Estero. So there's a question of finances, of trades, of give and take. So that's, if we want to have control of our resources and our recreations in town, that piece we have to acquire because we don't own it. So that's, that's a part of it. And then we've got a piece of property across the street. There's much, there's much uh, notoriety about that property. Is it going to be developed? Is it going to be a hotel? Or is it going to be open space? That's going to be one of the most, the most obvious accesses to the river. And how do we preserve it so that that becomes a footnote of our recreational area? Uh, then we've got two other things. In recreation, Estero started out as a, basically this adult community. But as our expansion grows through, through people coming in and more developments, becoming more youth oriented. So now our recreation facilities have to take one aspect for adults and another aspect for children. That ties in with schools. So trying to be more comprehensive in our planning the, the idea would be to integrate a school playground with a park. And, and Ed, Ed is going to talk more about that in his presentation. But so those are the thoughts that we're all talking about. And then we want to have standards of new developments. In other words, a new development comes in, how much open space are they going to have to have? Because that can be part of zoning, not comprehensive planning. And these are the types of things that we're looking at. So we're going to have to look at things like modifying existing village and county objectives and policies, a master recreation plan, the gateways and beltways, school coordination, capital planning, because this is all going to take money, neighborhoods and pocket parts, wayside parts, and public access to all our natural resources. So this is what we're doing and the comprehensive aspect of it, the big picture. And this is where you come in, because anything that is of particular interest to you and any one of these subjects, make sure that you get prepared with your group, Pete's doing, as Bev's doing, as Ed's doing, and make your presentation known so that it can be modified and incorporated into the master plan and become a goal for the final, well not the final, but the continuing growth and development of this era. So that's where we're coming from. Uh, any questions? Well, we'd like to see you all participate so that this village is your village with your input. Thank you, Jim. So Wednesday afternoon is the Planning and Zoning Board, and uh, we'll be dealing with the parks and recreation stuff you've been talking about. And Wednesday evening at 5 30 is the design review board meeting, and that's when the NCH project comes up. Okay, so we would encourage everybody to spend Wednesday <laughs> <laughs> focusing on, uh, on uh, community concerns, you know, uh, and join, join us at, both in the afternoon and in the evening <laughs> at the village hall. <laughs> village hall. All these meetings are in the village hall in the concert chambers on the first floor on the uh, south side. Yes. Does, does the uh, does Estero have control over what NCH is doing there now? Do we have any say in that? Well, and that's the reason it's 
and this is going before the design review board, is they don't need a zoning change, okay? That property would permit uh, a health care facility, okay? It doesn't need to be rezoned to do that. So it comes before the design review committee uh, in terms of other conditions and that type of thing. This happens to be what they call a uh, PIM, <coughs> preliminary information meeting. Now, so it, there will be no votes taken on the NCH thing at this point in time. It's an opportunity for the developer to tell the community what he'd like to do, bottom line. But on the other side of that, it's an opportunity for the community to tell the developer what they want them to do, right, with that property. Now, I have been, so there will not be a staff report. There will be no analysis to help you with this at this stage of the game. There will be later on when it goes to a final vote by the design review board for the project, okay? That's a later hearing. But at, at this point in time, I, it's my belief that uh, they will need a condition at, the, to be approved by the village to be 24-7, okay? 24-hour operation right next to, my, my, immediately my. adjacent <laughs> to a community like that is, is not, not, not happen every day. And of course, you've got ambulance, uh, noises and all that type of thing for that kind of a facility whereas you got it and then you got another but the the whole argument about it being competitive with uh, Lee Memorial etc uh, that's not admissible that isn't going to get you any place unfortunately uh, but I think there will be conditions that they need to get village approval on that may be very, very uh, helpful and hopefully achievable. But we'll, we'll find out more about that as the uh, whole process uh, unfolds. Uh, other questions on that? Okay, thank you. Uh, next is uh, Tom McDonald, who you've seen now a couple of times. Uh, not hard to miss. <laughs> uh, Tom is our, our communications director and uh, been working on a lot of our, trying to improve our communications. Uh, good morning, everybody. I have a really easy job, right? So I get to talk about the fun stuff we're doing. Uh, so as we continue through the process of giving ourselves a little bit better look, oops, let me go, there we go. We move on to the website. Um, the website and web presence is going to be updated within the next two weeks. As you look up here, you can see some basic ideas of what it's going to look like. Um, that's preliminarily what the view of the website is going to look on the home page. This kind of, you know, it's fresh, it's easy to, to see all the information. Right now, the, it's basically a big blog, the website, which is basically putting a bunch of news stories all down a big page, right? So the way we've done it now is just separate it up so that you can come to the, the top of the website and be able to navigate to what's most interesting to you right away. Okay, so you can see what's going on with everything. <coughs> will it be the same address? It will, absolutely. Yeah, we're not gonna change any of that at all. Um, it'll, and for SEO purposes, which means the way it's listed on Google as well, we're, we're not gonna change any of the data that's in it either. Okay, so right now we're actually, if you look up the Stero, um, ECCL website's the number two thing that comes up, uh, period. So uh, I think the village is number one and uh, then number eight. So, all right. So with March analysis, basically the highlights, I'm going to skip this and I'm going to talk through it while we're going through the, the highlights. The website performance. Um, it's gone up again. Every month it's gone up about 20% over the last uh, three months, which means there's 20% more people engaging the website. Also, uh, page views have gone up because of the way that the data is organized. Uh, they're gone up to about 30%. If you see it's 26.6 there for page views. The amount of pages that people are looking at has gone up a little bit and the average amount of time people are staying on the website, okay, so which is super important. Um, the amount of time people are on the website is 
really engagement, right? Like, are we reading what's there? Are we injured? Are we engaging what's there? Uh, that's now about 32%. So that means that the information people are finding is interesting and it's engaging. Oops. All right, so we had just about 2,100 people who went to the website this year, uh, this last month. We had 900 of those came from Google, and then 689 of those came from ads that we're running right now on Facebook. Um, we're trying to figure out where engagement can be, and we're seeing that right now there's a lot of people engaging us on Facebook with a $25 budget. All right, we're using 25 bucks a month, and we got 600 people engaging from that. Uh, if you look, Estero Today, Estero Counts, Estero Village, all of those are keywords that, meaning those are things in our website that are connecting our for searches. So when people go online and they look up on Google, those words we're ranking within the top ten. So it's. Uh, so when people are looking for what's going on in stereo, they're finding us. All right, so this is the ad that I was talking about. It's just a very simple thing. This is the one of the ads, I'm sorry, that we were talking about. This was actually for a uh, entrepreneur workshop that we decided to help uh, promote as well. Um, I think this ad actually was like $9 is what we ran for. Um, we had a of 25 people, and the engagement on the ad uh, was uh, 2,236 engagements, okay? Which means that that means that that's how many people saw it and were, uh, you know, it, at least it was inside of their Facebook profile for them to see. One of the things we keep doing is we keep making custom memes. That's basically pretty pictures like those uh, to kind of have people share. What's the coolest part about that is that's what's happening. Uh, the people who are either part of our Facebook family or other people, just regular people, are sharing these. We had almost 2,000 shares between these, meaning that people were taking our logo, their logos on all that, and just spreading it out so people can see us, see what we care about, see what's going on with our area. Okay? And then last but not least, in just the uh, overview of what Facebook was, and that's again, post, this is the, that ad we ran. We had six more likes, we had 22 more page views, we had 600 engagements on our page, and uh, videos. So the next, the next thing for me to talk about real quick, before I turn it back over to Don, uh, we also have videos that we're in process of finishing up. So there's a historical video about the ECCL. Also, what we are doing currently is going to be done, and we'll be able to share those next time for your, for the next meeting. Uh, we also are being uh, we're working on some LinkedIn stuff too. So you're going to see us pretty much everywhere. So if you guys have any, uh, if you're online, if you're on LinkedIn, if you're on Facebook, please come and like the pages. Because the more information can, we can get to you that way, the easier it is for you guys to communicate with us as well. And last but not least, if anybody's interested in communications, I do. I am looking for some people to help out in the communications committee um, for basically junior reporting. That's what I'm going to call it. Uh, we're going to have people go out to some of the meetings and some of the different things that are happening take cell phone pictures of what's going on, you know, so we can put that on social media and communicate with everybody, okay? Any questions? Yes. Is it the Facebook under Estero Council Community Leaders or is it under ECCL? It is under both. So if you search it, it will come up. Yep. Estero Council Community Leaders and or ECCL. Yep. All right. Thank you guys very much. Adrian and Meyer, our uh, membership chairman, couldn't be here uh, this morning, so I'm going to do her uh, very brief report. Uh, we're in the middle of a membership drive uh, be 
season starts at the beginning of the year and donations go out to all, all the communities. Uh, our, our peak, going back a couple of years, was 37 communities that having paid dues, you know, that type of thing. And where they designate a member attending these meetings, hopefully, uh, and an alder, that type of thing. So that's been the foundation of ECCL for all the many years that we've been in operation. Uh, the, uh, the dues themselves uh, cover, raise about $10,000 a year, which uh, helps to pay for uh, some of our media, our communications expenses, not all of them by any means. And so we, we long term, we have to figure out some way to uh, increase that income. We haven't raised the dues very much, very often. They're still, I think the top is maybe uh, five, six hundred dollars for the largest community. But in any instance, this year, the, uh, the, the number of communities that have uh, already paid their dues, which is well above anything in the past that we've ever done, it's up to about 25 or 26, somewhere in that neighborhood, out of the 35 or so like to get. And Marsh Landing, uh, Reserve of Sterile, uh, the Hyatt Coconut Plantation, Wildcat Run are the latest ones that uh, just sent in their uh, sent in their dues. Uh, we we uh, are in the process of forming a membership committee. We found as you can see uh, listening to some of our presentations that having committees in each of these areas is very, very beneficial. Uh, we now have three uh, operating working committees, okay? The Environmental Committee, the Transportation Committee, and the Speaker's Panel. The Speaker's Panel, de facto, is a community development uh, committee. And each of them meets once a month uh, and uh, prepares for the different activities that are going on, often the testimony that's required, uh, whether it be at the village level, the county level, the wherever, MPO or other, uh, elsewhere. But uh, membership of the committee doesn't take a whole lot of time. It's usually a meeting, uh, and then you'll be encouraged to participate in some other activities. Uh, so uh, we found, frankly, that it's a great training ground. That's where our board members come. Is, uh, they're, they're people who've been active on different committees and have demonstrated a commitment to the organization and to the community. So uh, we just started again with the same process we used in the past. We sent out an email to everybody uh, and asked for volunteers for the uh, new membership committee and. Uh, what happened to that? That's, huh? that's the email. Oh, okay. That, this is the, yeah, the alert that went out. He informed me. <coughs> and uh, thus far, uh, we have uh, two people who responded uh, to that uh, that request. And one of them is sitting right, right up here in the front row, Maureen uh, Forrest Bath from Shadowwood. Maureen? Uh, raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for stepping up. Appreciate it. And uh, Ken, uh, what is it, Jose? Uh, is Ken here? Uh, not here today, apparently. From Dolphin uh, Sound. Now, we, we obviously would like to expand that committee, so anybody that's interested, uh, please uh, uh, let us know. The committee itself uh, is primarily uh, designed to help put together a, present, a presentation that we will use once again to go out into different communities and explain what ECCL's role is, to listen to the concerns of the community and that type of thing, uh, and, uh, and basically begin a better dialogue than we have had here uh, with with individual communities uh, and and to try to make sure that the 
at the boards of those communities are informed by their members about what's going on outside of their gates. That's what these meetings are all about. We very much appreciate your coming to learn all about all of this and to interact with it. Uh, but that's the name of the game. It's a relationship between the various communities uh, and the leadership of ECCL that uh, has, been, has been vital and the participation of our members uh, in uh, all of the different activities, the governing activities uh, the, of the different bodies that influence where the heck we're going and, and what it's going to be like, you know, that type of thing. Being in a small community, it, it's worked pretty darn well. And having so many gated communities has been a, a real asset, made it, made it easy to try to structure something like this because you have governing bodies in each of those communities uh, you know that are, that are concerned with the interior problems of the local the, the community problems they don't have time to think about what's going on outside the gate yet in a fast growing community like this there's always a lot going on and you know somebody needs to be addressing that and that's the role that we've played over the years so uh, this group We'll be developing a, uh, a communications program and helping to implement it. That's why we need some additional people. Now, we did this twice before. Back in uh, 2004, uh, Benita uh, had been prohibited from annexing any property in Astero when, when their, their charter included uh, such a provision. They originally wanted to go all the way up to Williams Road. That was their, that was their original map. Okay? And the fire chief, uh, prior to uh, having a dentist, got Dennis last name, prior to Scott. Merrifield. Yeah, Dennis Merrifield. Uh, didn't want that to happen because he was fearful that even though it takes a separate act of the legislature, that somehow he's going to end up losing part of his turf. And, uh, and so he was, they were the, uh, some of the people here from the Sparrow were able to convince Bert Saunders, who's then the state senator, to trim back that boundary and take it back where it is uh, at the northern, uh, well, just south of the Brooks. And so uh, in any instance, in, after that five year period was over, Benita then wanted to annex, and they were they were really anxious to get Coconut Point, bottom line, uh, and to really kind of steal our, our tax base and our ability, frankly, to have a large enough scale in order to become a municipality. And so the first time we did presentations in the community, we talked about a village with a vision, because we all had a village plan by that point. And we, we created a village with a vision presentation and went out to about 35 or 40 communities and, and educated them <coughs> that they were actually in Astero. And many of them had uh, Benita post offices. They got there in, in Benita, especially in that south end now. Mm -hmm. uh, so then later on, uh, much later on, a couple of years ago, once again, when Benita was annexing uh, and uh, ECCL decided that we were going to make a push for incorporation, we did the same thing. We, made, we developed a presentation, made about 40 presentations to the different communities around and, uh, and that type of thing. So now that we have a village that plays a significant role, took over a lot of the roles that we had played before, lobbying the county. Uh, our, our roles change, so we need to get out and try to educate everybody about what it is that we do and how we complement rather than compete with the, uh, with the village. And so that's what this committee is all about, and I hope that others of you uh, will, uh, will join with uh, Karen or Maureen and Kias uh, so that we can have a, a good working effective membership. Uh, is that the end of uh, that one, Pete? I thank you very much. Uh, <coughs>
Uh, finally, the uh, financial report. And then the tech will roach is going to do that. He doesn't look like Bob, but. I just want it's just an improvement, right? Sure, thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. I, I have the enviable position of being the last speaker, and I am presenting financial. Promise, I'll be very quick. This is uh, these numbers represent financials for the month of March, as you can see, or maybe you can't see. <laughs> as you can see, uh, income was in the vicinity of seventy-five hundred dollars, as Don's already shared. Uh, all of our income comes from the dues from our member communities, so we thank the uh, communities for that. Expenses came in uh, just a little over eleven hundred dollars. Majority of the uh, expenses there are standard op monthly operating expenses, much of which it is for our communications, our PR, and our media, and that does include Tom's twenty-five dollars on Facebook. <laughs> um, so our net income for the month was uh, sixty-three. Uh, sixty-three hundred dollars. Net income for the year is about forty-one hundred dollars, and our cash balance in our account is nineteen thousand four hundred twenty as of the close of March. Now, we do have, um, at to date, we've had 25 member communities uh, pay their annual dues. Warren, I apologize, I gave you bump information. I looked at the wrong list earlier. But 25 uh, communities have paid. We are very thankful on behalf of the ECCL. We thank you for those payments. And we specific, and especially rather, thank each and every one of you that may have been involved in ensuring those payments were received. We do have a small number of communities that have not yet had an opportunity to send in their payments. Um, we do have, we will be reaching out to people, but if you possibly are representing one of those communities, we would appreciate any assistance you could provide in getting those payments sent in to us. Short and sweet, if anybody has any questions. Any comments from the audience before we adjourn? <laughs> uh, our next meeting will be back at the park. Uh, we moved over here simply because we originally were scheduled for last Friday, which was Good Friday, and uh, we decided to postpone it and take it off of that uh, religious holiday. But the next uh, meeting is uh, Friday, May the 12th, uh, and going back to our usual uh, second Friday of the month. Uh, at the historical community park. Thank you all for coming and for staying. Appreciate it.